attempt to address them at the end. Uh, you should all see that there's a, a lot of heat pump activity out in the news at the moment. Wood Mackenzie have a big splash on heat pumps out there today. And some of you, if you're tracking this stuff, you might be uh, aware that we do have a Twitter feed available from the, from the GSHPA to pick up on some of what's going on. Okay, so today our presenter is Laura Bishop from Infinitas Design. Uh, Laura is a great champion for heat pumps and, and for heat networks and, and their combination thereof. She's a council member of the GSHPA and she's a SIBSI net network consultant. So I'm really looking forward to uh, Laura clarifying the distinction uh, between fourth and fifth generation heat networks. Over to Laura. Okay, thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you everybody for joining today. Um, so the topic as Robin has introduced is the is fourth and fifth generation district heat networks and subtitle how heat pumps can fit into those or do very nicely fit into those. Um, I've attended a couple of webinars during shutdown or during lockdown on fourth and fifth generation networks. So there is so much information out there and I'm not going to go into great detail about what first generation, second generation is uh, up to fifth generation. Um, and this is by no means a, uh, and I've got all the answers and this is it. There's a lot to pack in in 30 minutes. So we're, we're simply not going to be able to cover everything. But what I'm really hoping is that there is a lot of, talk at the moment as Robin said about heat pumps and heat networks and I'm hoping that this might actually be the start of maybe a wider conversation and not just a conversation but things actually happening in in terms of uh, fourth or fifth generation networks and heat pumps specifically so hopefully today I'm going to show you a couple of case studies of the two um, talk about the benefits and the sort of drawbacks of, of each and uh, what the government is sort of saying at the moment about uh, heat networks and heat pumps um, and at the end it, there will be half an hour or so of Q&A time but hopefully as I say there'll be a lot more this will spur a lot more questions and a lot more conversation that's what I'm really hoping for. So just some very basic as I said I'm not going to go into this in great detail because it has been covered on a lot of other webinars um, but generally what is a heat network? Um, I always think of it as a uh, everybody's familiar with what a gas network is, pipes bringing gas to your house. Well, a heat network is bringing hot water or sometimes cold water to your building. So it's a distribution system of insulated pipes, sometimes not insulated actually, that takes heat from a central source and delivers it to a number of domestic or non-domestic buildings. Um, that's specifically about first to fourth generation and uh, we'll cover off the fifth generation after this. And as we've seen very recently, heat networks do form an important part of the government's plans to reduce carbon, cut heating bills and get us to that holy grail of net carbon zero um, by 2050 or whenever it is today, because it changes quite a bit. Um, so very basically, again, fourth generation, typically around 50 to 60 degrees C flow temperature in the network. So that's generally coming from a centralized plant. It could be a gas CHP, it could be a gas boiler, it could be a heat pump, a biomass boiler, but it tends to be lower temperature than the standard we've seen up to now, sort of in more recent heat networks where you're looking at 80 degrees C from a gas CHP or a, or a gas boiler. That's third generation. Fourth generation is lower temperature. Um, and it's a good low carbon enabler because of the fact that heat pumps and lower temperature um, systems can attach onto the network. Uh, fifth generation on the other hand is sometimes also called an ambient loop and it tends to be very very low temperature or ultra low temperature sometimes called which could be anywhere between 5 and 20 degrees C in the network and that is exactly the same it looks the same as the standard heat network it's still pipes in the ground um, but instead of having sort of hot or warm water in there you're looking at more much more cooler temperatures and again it's a great low carbon enabler which is why fourth and fifth generation should be what we're all talking about now and third generation in my opinion uh, should be there's loads of them out there but we should be leaving them where they are and moving forward now, fourth, fifth generation. 
So I thought it would be good. I don't see a lot of webinars where there's good examples of these. So I thought it would be a good example, a good time to show a couple of examples. These are ones I've specifically been involved in. Um, there are loads of examples out there. Lots of uh, members of GSHPA and the HPA have good examples of fourth and fifth gen systems that are in and operational. Um, so these are just two of mine. Um, so this is my first example of a fourth generation network. It's the North Aston Estate, which is in Oxfordshire, and I do have some pictures of this, so it's not all just words. Um, it's, it's a village where the landowner owns quite a number of houses and rents them out to people. Um, there are 26 houses in this village that are owned by the landowner, and they are all off the gas grid. In fact, the whole village is off the gas grid. These houses are heated with oil boilers or electric storage heaters, or in some cases, no heating at all. Some of them just have argers or a coal fire, no central heating system whatsoever. Um, obviously that causes problems for the landowner as well as tenants, because the tenants are, some of them are in fuel poverty, so they're struggling to pay bills, um, their heating bills or electric bills. Um, they're also struggling because they may be um, older and uh, they need the house to be nice and warm and it's just not warm at the moment it's bad for the fabric when you have homes that are not heated properly one of the big headaches for the the landowner was that the um, houses all have very low EPC so when they come up to be re-rented they can't effectively be re-rented because the EPC I think was down at a G or an H and that is now too low to enable houses to be rented. So they looked at a few options and we helped them have a look at some options as well and what we decided to come up with was a centralised energy centre serving all of the houses via a brand new heat network and the energy centre in this case housed six NEBI F134560 kilowatt heat pumps operating at 60 degrees C most of the year um, that's got its own issues um, but that, that's what we've done um, they're all located you have to say in a brand new energy center with a thermal store that's connected on the one side to a horizontal loop ground collector it's a nice rural location so plenty of land um, the landowner has got his own sort of um, diggers and, and ground excavators so he was able to dig a lot of the trenching himself and then on the other side, we've put in a brand new heat network and each house will have an HIU, which will replace the boiler if it's got a boiler. Um, there have been some fabric upgrades in the houses. Some of them have had brand new wet systems. There's been some double glazing put in and some radiator replacements where they were very small. Um, and the landowner is charging their tenants rather than charging them a heat price. They're giving them a, um, a much reduced um, price or a heat cost in which is built into their rent so that means that they're paying um, a known amount of money for their heat and it's a fair use it's been based on fair use factors the landlord or the landowner receives non-domestic RHI for 20 years so that's that's helped him with his capex costs because he knows that over the long term he's going to be getting some income it's a metered system because it's heat pumps shared between multiple properties and the tenants themselves will benefit from well heated houses in some cases, clean heat because they're not burning oil anymore. And where they are paying for heat at the moment via oil bills, um, there will be no increase in their heat bill. That's one of the most important things actually is to make sure that tenants are not stung with their bills by putting in a new heat pump or heat network system. So I've already said the design flow and return temperatures are 6040, and that has been driven a little bit by the fact that we've put HIUs in each of the houses and the need to keep domestic hot water temperatures up at around 45, 50 degrees. Um, some fabric upgrades, which I've mentioned, but we've actually put in six heat pumps and we don't need six heat pumps from day one, but a lot of other people, the private homeowners have also expressed some interest in joining the network. So we decided to add some more heat pumps into the energy center um, to enable more people to hook up later should they want to do that. Um, otherwise we'd have limited ourselves purely to these 26 homes. And there's a good opportunity for the landowner to make a bit of money by charging the private people um, a heat price and meter their heat um, and charge them for that which is you know another good way of paying for the infrastructure and everything that's gone in for, for the network and just 
obviously a very important one, um, which we're all trying to do, reduce carbon. Uh, if all of the 26 houses were on oil boilers based on oil, boil, oil usage for the ones that do have boilers, we would be saving about 128 tonnes of CO2 per year, um, which is 82% of the oil baseline, which is actually, you know, a really big amount. So you can imagine how many small villages like this there are around the UK. We can be seeing massive carbon savings by putting in a system such as the one I've just described. And on this page, we've just got um, a very high level heat network route map on the left there. So we've got um, the energy center is this red blob here. And then we've got three separate branches on the network. We've got um, a west branch, a south branch and an east branch. And the houses that are blacked in are the tenant houses. Uh, and then there's some houses down here that potentially have shown some interest in joining a network as well. And these are the typical houses that we're looking at. So they're not brand new, far from it. They are not well insulated, although there have been some upgrades. But these houses will, uh, you know, once COVID is, is done and dusted and the weather improves, uh, these will be heated with um, heat pump heat via a fourth generation network. And we will be spending time talking to tenants and finding out how that is all going. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to publish some information of that how this has actually worked and um, lessons learned and things like that to, to go forward. The bottom picture here just shows the location more or less of where the energy center is going to be. So you can see it's quite a rural, but it's very rural location. So plenty of room for the energy center and the heat network. Um, another benefit that this village had because we were digging up for the heat network, they've been able to get fiber, fiber optic broadband brought in as well, which has been laid into the trenches at the same time. And there are grants available for that. So there's all kinds of benefits for this kind of system, which is, it's just been amazing to be involved with it, to be honest. Um, so we'll keep you up to date and please feel free to ask questions about this and how it's going. Um, Cause I'd love to see this being rolled out in more villages around the UK. So on to fifth generation. Um, as I say, I'm not going to be able to present loads and loads of stuff about all these different projects. And there are people hopefully sitting on this uh, webinar who are thinking, yep, I've done this. I've got loads of examples myself. That's brilliant. The one I've been involved with lately is, um, I know that Kenza are doing a lot of work with these kind of schemes. So these are where housing associations own blocks of flats. Um, in this case, uh, there on the right, these ones are up north. Um, each of the 70 flats had individual gas boilers. They're sheltered housing, so elderly and vulnerable people. And the Housing Association decided to go down the route of a heat pump system, which is brilliant. Um, but rather than putting in a central energy centre and serving each flat with um, water at 55 to 60 degrees C, they've decided to replace all of the gas boilers with small ground source heat pumps. In this case, they are inverted driven six kilowatt heat pumps in each flat. And as I say, Kenza have been doing this for a long time and other housing associations and companies are doing this as well. Um, so on this particular one, we have boreholes drilled around the flats in the area um, of that green area you can see. And we are pumping that out of the ground. Um, ground temperature is sort of around eight degrees C, fluctuates slightly depending on time of year how much heat is being extracted. And then we've got brand new pipe work uh, running up the side of the buildings. So maybe a little bit unsightly, but it, the Housing Association not bothered in this case. Sometimes they can run internally, it all depends on the space available in the flats. So we've got brand new uh, runners and risers running outside the building, penetrating through the wall and then running through the communal corridors and then eventually dropping down into each boiler cupboard which now houses a heat pump. And the heat pump then takes the eight degrees C brine temperature and bumps it up to make it whatever the flat needs. It might be 50 degrees, it might be 55, 60. Uh, and each flat can obviously be doing their own thing. So if Mr Smith wakes up at 6am he needs his heat then and Mrs Jones wakes up at 10 o'clock and she needs a heat then, they're not bound by a central energy plant their own heat pump can do its own thing and it just continually takes heat from that ambient network. And this is a different way of billing. The tenants are actually billed via a heat meter in their flat, so they pay for what they use and a heat price will have been agreed with the tenant based on um, 
all sorts of different factors and each heat price is different. And again, looking at carbon savings on this one, um, assuming a gas boiler of efficiency of about 80%, and in this case, I think we use heat pump COP of 3.6, um, we're looking at savings, carbon savings of about 57 tonnes CO2 per year, or 72% of the gas baseline. Each one will be slightly different though, obviously, depending on what the baseline was. Um, the next slide just shows, this is my brain dump of what I think I want to think of a fifth generation network. And again, there are loads of pictures that, that are on the internet and that people have presented about what a fifth generation is. And essentially in the middle there, you've got the loop. Uh, it's an ambient loop. It's low temperature, five to 20 degrees, as I've already said. And dotted all around there is different, different things that serve the heat network and are served by the heat network. So what we've got is we have got um, waste heat from power stations, which can dump its heat instead of dumping it into rivers as they do at the moment. It can actually be used usefully, so dumping that into the, into the network. We've got rivers um, via a heat exchanger that can be putting heat or cool into the network. We've got traditional boreholes, which can also be uh, putting heat into the network. Mine water that's been in the news quite a lot recently that's got temperatures of maybe 30 degrees C all in pools below the ground which, where mines are filled up with water those can be used to plug into the network and then we also have here um, new build housing generally heat demand only um, office blocks which need heating and cooling leisure centres which you've got uh, buildings of different ages and data centres which produce a lot of heat and need cooling so the benefit, the massive benefit of an ambient loop network is that all of these buildings and generators of heat and cool can be plugged in and that network will run and serve each of the buildings. So what you'd then be looking at is in each house or in office or leisure centre, they'd all have their own heat pump. And again, this is a big benefit because in a new build house, nice and well insulated, uh, probably doesn't need an awful lot of heat, still needs domestic hot water though. You could be using in there a bog standard, fairly cheap and cheerful, um, although obviously high quality uh, heat pump that might be delivering 50 degrees C. So it's taking heat off the network at maybe 10 degrees and then bumping that up inside the house whenever the house needs it. So house one might need it, as I said before, at six o'clock in the morning and house two might need it at midday. Each heat pump will do its own thing. The temperature is whatever the house needs at that time. Next door to that, you've got an office um, and that might have its own heat pump that is doing simultaneous heating and cooling. So extracting the heat or the cool off the network and either generating cold temperatures for the building or hot temperatures for the building for heating. Um, the other thing to say about that is that because it's on an ambient loop, sometimes it can take free cooling off the network, depending on the temperature in the network. Typically cooling comes in at seven degrees C from a chiller. So that if the ambient loop was operating at seven degrees C for whatever reason, you could bypass the heat pump altogether and just put 70 degrees C um, water around that building and that would be sufficient to cool the building without any electrical demand except for pumping. If the temperature of the loop then rose to say 10, 11, 12 degrees, the heat pump would kick in a little bit, well, sorry, it would be wicking chilling then, um, but that would then kick in to produce the chilled water required. Um, so you end up with a very nicely balanced, or you can end up with a very nicely balanced loop. Just in the top right here, we've got thermal storage, and I think that is a very, very important um, aspect of all of this. Um, thermal storage enables, um, particularly enables demand response. So if none of these buildings were demanding heat, um, but there was plenty of heat and it was actually cheap to produce um, heating, you can use thermal stores and these could be dotted about all over the place. Um, you could use that to store your heat during the daytime, uh, sorry, during the nighttime when there's no heat demand and then release during the day when there's when electricity is more expensive or if there's a lot of PV on your development you could be producing hot water or chilled water when plenty of sun is available even if there's no demand on the network and then you could reject that back into the network when there is um, a demand 
from one of these one or more of these buildings. The other thing about multiple buildings is that sometimes you've got old buildings and sometimes you've got new buildings. So new buildings, like the new houses up here, they need standard heat pumps. An older building, like the one you can see here, this is Victoria Leisure Centre, they may be better served with a high temperature heat pump, which are available. Um, we have propane heat pumps, we have ammonia heat pumps that can run up to 80, 90 degrees C. They are more expensive and the efficiencies of them are lower because they have to work harder to get those temperatures up there, but they are perfectly available now on the market, operating right now. Um, but the benefit obviously of that is that here you can have a heat pump that is working at very high efficiency or even in the new bits of the ledger centre. Over here you can have a separate heat pump working at lower efficiency but still keeping the building um, comfortable. And that is the benefit of these, of these loops. Um, they're also enable you to expand the system later on so if you have a new power station being built you could look at rejecting the heat from that into the loop um, you can't do that with a fourth generation network because you need to be matching temperatures really at 60 degrees that kind of temperature finally my final point on there is negligible network losses because heat loss is driven by the temperature difference between inside a pipe and outside a pipe the lower that temperature difference, the less heat loss you get. So if, for example, you've got a network running at 10 degrees C and your ground is at 10 degrees C, um, there is zero heat loss in that network. Um, if your network was running at 7 degrees C and your ground was at 10, you'd actually get free heating going into the, into the ambient loop because the, the the movement of heat would be from the ground into the pipe. When you've got pipes operating at 60 degrees C, the water in there is 60 degrees C and their ground is at 10, obviously you're getting uh, a loss from within the pipe out into the ground because it's a 50 degree uh, delta T between the two. So another benefit of ambient loops is negligible losses. So just some um, pros and cons. Uh, just th some things to think about. These are what came to mind immediately when I thought, OK, so what's the difference? How would you know whether it's best to do fourth gen or fifth gen? So just the first thing to say is it's very site and customer specific. There, there is no one size fits all for any of these. And there's also a place for individual heat pumps per building without a network. So that is another option. So this week, somebody called me up and said, um, a new client and said, we're looking to build some new low rise blocks of flats. And my initial thought was fifth generation network because I've recently been working on them. Why would you not put a heat pump in each flat? So I mentioned this to him and he, and he said, no, 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 I definitely want centralized heat pumps with heat going to each flat. And he had very, very valid reasons for doing that. So keep an open mind at the start of a project you may already have preconceived ideas about what you want to do, but try to keep open minded because what worked on one project last week may not be suitable for your current project this week. Considering if heat and cool is needed, if it's a mixed use development, cooling demand as well as a heating demand, certainly bring fifth generation to the front of your mind because they can work extremely well as we've just seen in the previous slide. Also consider building types and ages. If you've got a mix of old and new, again, it might be worth considering ambient loop because you can have a high temperature heat pump in one building and a low temperature standard heat pump in another building. So again, um, a consideration um, to keep in mind. Space requirements, I found this to be really important. So if you're looking at small flats or small houses, there may simply not be room for an individual heat pump inside those flats. The Kenza make a shoebox um, heat pump and other manufacturers are making very small heat pumps. So it's unlikely that that will be the case, but you just never know. And it might be that somebody doesn't want their airing cupboard filled up with a heat pump or a cylinder. They may just not want to do that. So in that case, you're back to fourth generation centralised plant. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not like one is better than the other. One will work for an application. So it's just it's finding the right application for the, the right solution for the right application. Uh, expandability if there's plans to expand in the future to add more houses add more offices add more waste heat sources definitely fifth generation is probably the way to go so you don't want to limit yourself um, early on in the project 
grants and incentives is an important one. So the two case studies I showed, this is specific to RHI actually, which we know is coming to an end quite soon, but we've still got one or two years of that. Um, on the first example there, we had a shared heat pump system. That means that the landowner can take metered RHI for 20 years. So for him, that was a benefit. That's what he wanted to do. On the second option, the second case study, the Housing Association will take RHI for 20 years based on deemed payments. So it's low risk. You know exactly what you're going to get in terms of RHI because it's based on a flats EPC or a house's EPC. So bear in mind that there are different, different tunes to play on the different grants and incentives that are available when you're thinking about which route to go down. And finally, um, investigate if there are actually other local networks already in the area. Um, I don't actually know how you go about that, but in the early stages of, a, of an investigation, it might be worth talking to other people that you know might have worked locally and say, is there a network that we could possibly hook up to here? And finally, a plug, obviously, for heat pumps. Um, heat pumps are the only low carbon, zero emissions or zero point of use emissions heat and cool solution for buildings. There is nothing else on the market that can do that. I'm quite willing to be shot down when I say that, uh, but I am I'm, I'm convinced that this is the route we should be taking. Um, why would you have uh, an electric chiller and a gas boiler when you can have one heat pump that will do cooling and heating? You, we do not want to be burning stuff anymore. We, we want to improve our air quality. Even burning green gas still produces emissions into the atmosphere, particulates. Um, heat pumps um, can take renewable electricity from wind and PV where there's no emissions at all. And they're available now. We've been putting them in for a long time. We're still putting them in today and we will be putting them in. They're available now. It's not a 10 year wait for hydrogen. Heat pumps are here now. So we should be doing it <laughs> right now. So shameless plug, but there we go. And this is the last slide for now. So the government support. Um, not going to go into this too much detail, mainly because there's not a lot of detail. Um, RHI has been driving the industry for better and for worse. But what we do know is that in March 2021, um, all renewable heat um, technologies, including heat pumps, less than 100 kilowatts, the RHI will end. So for new applicants to the scheme. That's been extended by one year for domestic projects. So domestic renewable heat projects will continue to be able to apply for RHI up to March 2022. And if you have a tariff guarantee in place for heat pumps greater than 100 kilowatts, that now is continuing to March 2022 as well. So there's a little bit of time and obviously a heat pump will get RHI whether it's connected to a heat network or not. The Heat Network Infrastructure Programme finishes in March 2022. That's been supporting a lot of heat network projects, but they have mainly been gas and gas CHP driven. So again, back on the third generation networks, not a lot of fourth generation networks. So what's coming next? We've just had the future heat strategy consultation um, finish this week. Um, so the GSHPA um, put in a response to that, as did a lot of the members, and hopefully a lot of people on the call will have put in something. But that has very much focused on green gas and the heat pump market sub 45 kilowatts. And that's great, but from my point of view, if you're looking at offices and hospitals and schools, um, most of them do not need 45 kilowatts, they need a lot more than that. So there's a big massive gap, a big hole in what's going to happen there and how it's going to be supported. But the last thing that was, um, or the, another thing that has been announced by the government in the 2020 March budget was the Green Heat Networks Fund. And that will fund low carbon heat network projects from 2020 to 2025 at the moment, and the government are investing 270 million pounds into that. So they clearly see that this is the route we should be taking in the UK. Digging into that a little bit more, the definition of low carbon hasn't been made. So it could still be the burning of hydrogen or green gas. Um, it could be biomass, don't know, but it's definitely green, whatever green means to the government. 
I did also notice um, that the a new council has been set up, the Heat Networks Industry Council has been set up with a lot of the big names in there, and they are going to be um, looking at job creation, at, well, sport, you know, training, and also they're looking at driving up to £50 billion in sector investment, and there's some people who are in the GS GSHPA sitting on that council, which is great to know. So there is... Um, we're just seeing this shift. Oh, well, I am definitely seeing a shift towards these heat networks and going low carbon. And fourth and fifth generation is a massive, well, the only part of that, I think, in my opinion. So I've done quite a lot of talking. Um, as I said, there's lots to squeeze into 30 minutes. So um, I'm hoping that uh, there's a lot of questions coming through very happy to take them um, and also if you do have any questions that come to mind afterwards or you want to maybe chat about something in a bit more detail um, you can get hold of me via the email address on there I'm also on LinkedIn um, and you can find me by my website as well so um, I hope that's been informative I hope it's not been too much of a whistle stop tour uh, but uh, I'm quite happy to as I say answer any questions or uh, anything that's there now so thank you very much Thanks, Laura. That's a great overview of uh, these new networks. Um, concern behind the scenes is we know the government is really interested in heat networks. Our worry is that a uh, majority of them are going to be high temperature networks. So you clarifying the fact that you can have these lower temperature networks helps immensely. Uh, there are some questions here. I think there's a, a generic one that you might attempt to address. Okay. One, one of the unique features, um, and you might call it an awkward feature uh, of heat pumps, is that we tend to want to deliver heating and hot water at different temperatures. So we're attempting to go for low temperatures for heating and the highest mm -hmm. possible temperature for hot water. Yeah. I wondered if you could uh, give us a brief overview of how you did the hot water on your two case studies yeah okay so yeah absolutely um so the north aston one um the reason uh, I, I sort of alluded to it a little bit the reason we're having to run our heat pumps at 60 degrees c is because the hiu is it's not a standard one because it has been designed for lower flow temperatures um it's uh but we are having to deliver a set single temperature to the HIU in order to satisfy domestic hot water and heating. And that was an issue at the time. However, I've since found out, um, well, I've been talking to some of the manufacturers about HIUs and there are different things on the market that are quite interesting. So for example, um, one of the suppliers is making an HIU where there's an electrical inline element. It is additional electricity, I appreciate that. But you can deliver, for example, 40 degrees C or 45 into your HIU. Whenever a tap is opened, the electrical inline element within the HIU fires up and increases the temperature in the flow to um, temperatures that are suitable for domestic hot water. So people are thinking along the lines of, well, if we have a heat pump, we want to run it at low temperature but what about domestic hot water? Um, I think in places like offices, we might see more um, point of use. For example, you might only have, I don't know, 20, 20 hand basins in a massive office and you want to run your heat pump for the majority heating. So you might end up with just point of use, electrical heaters for hot water. Um, there's also the sort of the standard way of doing it, which is to fill up a um, hot water cylinder with hot water from a heat pump and then use an immersion heater to boost it. That's done for Legionella purposes, could be done if you needed higher hot water temperatures. But we need to remember that uh, running hot water at above 50 degrees C is not a great thing to do. In hospitals and old people's homes, um, we're looking at 45 degrees C max because if you put your hand under there for a long time, at more than 45 degrees, you will get scolded, especially if you're a vulnerable person. Uh, so we, I think we do need to get away from this idea that we need to be delivering, say, 55 degrees C domestic hot water. We don't. We absolutely don't. And if you're not storing water, there's no need to um, be generating high temperature hot water to deliver 45 degrees C. Legionella, obviously, really important, needs to be thought about. Um, but those are the ways that we're looking at. Yeah, sorry. Could, could you just cover, 
I'm aware of it, but for the benefit of others, could you cover why the distributed heat pump system allows you to overcome that problem? Yeah, uh, oh, so yeah, the fifth generation. Yeah. Um, well, it, in a way, it, it does mean that you don't need an HIU. So you can, you can actually run your heat pump at lower temperature. You do generally still need your cylinder. So if you had a heat pump just in your house, uh, you would maybe run that heat pump at temperatures for underfloor heating or for big radiators, maybe 40 degrees C, filling up a hot water cylinder at 40 degrees C, or you might sometimes run your, run your heat pump higher to get higher temperatures into your cylinder. The problem with doing it from a centralized system is that you might have only a, a single flow and a single return. And that single flow and return is having to do heating and hot water via an HIU, which means you have no choice but to run that network at much higher temperatures the HIU gives you a temperature drop across the plate and it means that when someone turns a tap on they instantly want hot water so your your network is having to run high temperature all the time and when I say high I mean like 60 degrees not 80. Mm. Thank you. Um, th there's people flagging up my bet noir and I'm sure you've addressed it but could you just perhaps touch on the issues of the pumping requirements on potentially on both sides of a, of a district heating mm -hmm. system and what care, why we're worried about it and what care you need to take about it. Absolutely. And I think Robin, when, when you did your um, talk three weeks ago, I think it was, you talked about um, the size of brine pumps and this is, this is, this can be an issue because obviously if you are pumping, um, a standard heat network might run, might run at 30 degrees or 40 degrees delta T. So your pumping can be, pumping costs will be very low. If you're running a brine network or a low temperature heat network, you've got to be very careful about the delta T's that you're going to get in there and pumping between different uh, things that are putting heat or cool into the network. Because if you've got a delta T of three, for example, say you were extracting out of a river, you needed to minimise your uh, delta T across, you know, extraction and abstraction, then your pumping for that is going to be obviously a lot higher and your pipes are going to be a lot bigger because your, your uh, delta T is a lot lower. Um, so it's certainly something that needs to be considered very early on in the design. So you're going to be looking at well, what delta T's are you able to um, achieve. Some heat pumps can only achieve delta T's of 10K. So there again, pumping costs go up and that, that's the same for whether you're looking at a fifth gen or a fourth generation network. So it, it, I totally appreciate that um, there will be different pumping costs and this is an on cost obviously because it's 20 years worth of um, pumping costs. So it's just something that needs to be considered very early on um, by the designer um, as to where the pumps are, what the delta T's are, how can you optimise those delta T's, can you combine delta T's across a network with different um, you know, a river here and a borehole here and a waste heat here. What's the overall delta and is there a way of optimising that so that you can minimise your pumping size and your pumping costs? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's flagging the issue up and making sure somebody addresses it. Um, Absolutely, and, th and that's why in these projects it's so important some people jump in with both feet and go straight into installation and, and this is one of my early... Um, webinars was about the importance of design so you wouldn't build a building without an architect with these kind of systems you absolutely have to have an engineer on board right from day one so that they can be advising and doing the calcs so you know obviously looking at the financial calcs as well as the the flow and head calcs and that because they are also and intertwined with one another there's a jumping around here question in from simon uh, kenza Traditional m and &E consultants don't understand the ground. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So they shy away from our technology. Understanding the ground and designing a suitable array is critical, especially if you're looking to cool as well. How do we provide them with the necessary support? I mean, it's a bit unfair to lobby you, Laura, but your, <laughs> your views on it. Yeah, that's it. Well, I've got very strong views and I, I have a bit of a, a whinge about this quite regularly about how in fact, we were talking about this last week. Um, 
it's it's a really good question and i don't have an answer um, apart from uh, there should be some way that m and &E consultants can feel able to come and talk to people in the GSHPA or the HPA or the HPF or the many other, you know, um, CIBC and people like that and talk to them about these systems. I don't know whether it's a pride thing and they just think we've always done it like that. So if it's new, we don't want to touch it um, or, you know, we, we don't understand it and we don't want to admit we don't understand it. I really don't know. But somehow there has to be a mechanism whereby if a client wants something like this doing that they tell the m and &E consultant please go and speak to the GSHPA or please go and speak to the HPA about it I don't know how you can do that and the problem is that because clients are not always aware that it's important to get this right and they're relying on the m and &E consultant the client is not always going to say you need to go and speak to a specialist on this all we can do is try and get the message out like this this is all we can do so social media, um, webinars, training online. Is the government going to help us? I don't know, because I don't know if the government really understand this either, that it's an issue. So I totally understand, Simon, and um, I just think we have to do what we can. I don't know, if, Robin, you've got any other ideas on that? I would agree with all you say. I got shot up quite badly in a webinar and another webinar recently when I said one of the blockers and it's a non-technical blocker um, is uh, M&E's looking at their PI and it's it's very safe for them to recommend a, a standard solution they're not going to get sued by anybody for lack of heat or lack yep. of cooling um, and so it's very tempting for them to default to um, to the standard offering rather than taking the risk. And somehow we, we are going to have to be able to provide the confidence that we minimize the risk. They yeah. can minimize the risk by engaging trained and qualified designers. Yeah. And, and, and you know, them understanding the limits, because obviously they, they are also very knowledgeable, but it's where they need to understand what their limit is and then where to go to get that help. And I think, I mean, I've been, considering this for ages and as a, as a industry I think it would be so important to put together a group of case studies which can go up on a website somewhere any website or be sent out to many &E consultants and go this is what's happening these are the blocks of flats that are either new build with um, ambient loops in them and this is how you do it and, and, it, and it works or this is an old block of flats or this is a mixed-use development and this is how it's doing heating and cooling and with the proof behind it of how much it was costing before how much it's costing now what the carbon was what it is now and maybe we would need that big book of case studies that you can hit people with and say here it's been done before come and talk to us if you need more information about it Robin can I just jump in is that okay uh, for you Simon yes <laughs> uh, because I agree with what's been said I think the ground array designers are in a fabulous position, um, but they've got a responsibility now to really promote themselves, whether they do that as individual companies or through the GSHPA, it just needs to be done because I'm terrified at the prospect of poorly designed arrays threatening the integrity of this technology. We are going to see an explosion in demand we're already seeing it and it's just very very difficult to control all of the designs that are being conjured up here there and everywhere i worry a little Laura, about case studies because i have this horrible fear that people say well because it worked there in that example i'll just copy it mm. up here and we all know how diverse the ground is but really the question wasn't designed to trip anyone up. It was designed to encourage you to go out there and say, we understand this. We need to hold hands and play nicely with the M&E community and try and find ways to give them the confidence that the ground is actually their best friend. You can yeah. do so much with the ground, which mm -hmm. you can do with the air. And we've just got to try somehow as a small industry to grow up very quickly, but there is a heavy responsibility, I think, on the players that have been doing this for a while mm -hmm. 
yeah. to do the marketing and hopefully the GSHPA can, can find ways to support as well. Mm. It's mission critical that we get the ground designs done properly. Absolutely. Um, it, it is almost like a, a disaster waiting to happen in many, many cases. Uh, if Bean was here, I'm sure he would be banging the heat pump federation drum as well because hopefully that is going to draw together a lot of different areas of industry and give a bigger voice um but yeah absolutely it, it's like we need to have some kind of partnerships with with the m a consultants there are many many of them there's obviously the very big ones that everybody knows but then there's also the local smaller ones and it's how we identify them and get in there not really proactive I think in terms of getting in there finding out what's going on and trying to get in there to avert a crisis without peeing them off <laughs> at the same time by being know-it-alls so uh, yeah it's a tricky one um yeah can i can i can i come in laura is that okay yeah, absolutely um, yes please I, do I, I was just looking to what simon says and, and and robin as well as one of the one of the designers that simon's referring to yeah we're, we're seeing a very strong market growth at the moment maybe we should have a webinar laura you you organize the webinars maybe we should have a webinar to brainstorm uh, and have a chat about how we build the expertise space in the the ground side of things and uh, i think that'd be an interesting topic for the future perhaps okay no, that sounds good, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're uh, taking bookings from beginning of September onwards. So I will get you or somebody, Simon, or somebody in there to uh, do that one. Good. Great. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Just, That's okay. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I might just bring it back. Those are some quite big, uh, wide area issues that definitely need to be addressed. Just to haul back, I mean, one comment, you, you implied it, Laura, but um, in your discussion about heat losses on, on ground loops, the, the implication, of course, of what you're saying is that on amb ambient ground loops, they really do not need to be insulated. Yeah. Um, you explained about the temperature differentials, but that is the consequence. So you can get away from expensive insulated uh, uh, heat network piping. Yes. Um, uh yeah, sorry, carry on. Sorry, right. you want to say something? Oh, no, I was just going to say, it uh, very much depends on what you're trying to achieve. And also, what you don't want to do is, if you're trying to do, a, say, for example, a passive cooling loop, and there's an, there is a chance that that's going to warm up because of something yeah. in the area, then you may want to, even though you're on an ambient loop, you may still want to consider um, insulated yeah. pipe. So I don't think it's a given that it's definitely not insulated, but there is a lot more opportunity for not using insulated pipe. You're right. Uh, two slightly picky issues, but we probably ought to just address them rather than let them go. Is on the Aston estate, the North Aston <coughs> example, um, there's a slight warning there about what happens when someone decides to ex expand the delivered uh, amount of energy um, mm -hmm. and I Im imagine that uh, on that site once they decided that they were going to supply some of the privately owned housing uh, there's some consideration about the extra ground loop that might be needed yeah. to deliver yeah. that energy. Absolutely so the the system has been designed to expand up to 360 kilowatts so the ground loop and the heat network has all been designed to deliver that amount of energy. So at the moment, ground loop is um, slightly under, it's not massive. It's, it, I think at the moment we're at a peak of about 290 kilowatts and go to 360. So it's not hugely different, but all the pipes in the, in the ground, the all heat network has been designed to deliver the peak output from the energy center, even though at the moment the velocities are slightly low because um, well, it hasn't actually been built yet because of COVID, but um, th there will be slightly low velocities uh, in the pipe work when it's delivered as phase one. So, yeah, certainly all been designed for maximum 360 kilowatts. Uh, great. It's, that's an important point that people need to take on board that, you know, that future expansion, the downside to some extent of ground loops, particularly mm. of closed loop systems, you... you can't just go on adding uh, hmm. delivery uh, willy-nilly. Um, we, we get the case of someone pays for quite an expensive closed loop system on their large house. 
and then surreptitiously tell you two years later that they've decided to heat the swimming pool as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so just it's just a warning there about ground loops. Um, yeah, it was, it's actually the same for heat networks, Robin, when I've designed a heat network and then find that somebody, instead of putting 500 kilowatts of heat pump in, they've decided to put 800 kilowatts of heat pump in and they haven't changed the size of the network. And that's, big, <laughs> that's a big problem. Um, um, because it's a bit of an HSE issue, uh, there are questions and comments on here about dealing with Legionella. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you, you'd want to comment on it, but the, there is the point that's, uh, particularly when you're looking at non-domestic systems, uh, where the, the regs are a bit tighter than they seem to be on non-domestic in the UK, oh, uh, is issues about um, exposing the system, the entire pipework system, to a high temperature for some length, some period of time to yeah. address Legionella. I don't know if you want to just touch on that. Yeah, yeah so I've got quite a few jobs um, where we're looking at very, for example, a very old school uh, where they've got old pipe work for um, domestic hot water um, and we're looking at uh, we're putting a heat pump in it's 70 degrees C heat pump um, so it's not it's not low low temperature but uh, they will be stored hot water um, and we will at some points in the network because it's long and there's a few dead legs we will actually potentially be uh, looking at um, areas where it'll fall below the 60 degrees C uh, we're working with the on site m and &E guys on that and it's something again it comes back to the early design is to identify where that's a problem and to work out um, a way of addressing that and obviously uh, uh, increasing the temperature of a hot water cylinder 60 degrees c for one hour per night is not going to help because that's not going to flush out the system the whole system so um, yeah it's again it's a case-by-case -case basis of how you deal with that um, and whether you bring your gas boilers on because most of these projects will still have um, high temperature in the background so do you bring your gas boilers on for a couple of hours um, every so often and then during the day so that when everybody's using the building the building is being flushed and there's there's different ways of doing it but it's very important to understand the building so it's all about this holistic thing it's not just about whack a heat pump in and switch it on and away you go. It's looking at the whole system, which is why you need an engineer on, the, on board from the start, really. Brilliant. Well, we're just about at the hour, so uh, I haven't got uh, any more burning questions. It's sorry, wrong phrase to use with heat pumps. <laughs> no uh, burning, <laughs> no combustion. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to thank you, Laura, for a great presentation. Thank everybody who dialed in. I uh, hope we manage to get something out of it and flag up that we've got an, another four of these uh, on, on the menu at the moment. So I think they're pretty much at weekly, weekly intervals. If you ha check out on the GSHB website, you'll find the timetable there and the topics. I hope to see you all uh, again soon. Many thanks for checking in. Bye Thank for you. now, everybody.